This is Walter Bosley, and I'm going to read a selection from Men in Black, The Secret Terror by Gray Barker, published in 1983. Chapter 13, The Brothers of the Shadow. The chapter starts with a quote. I am today transmitting to the National Security Council a proposal in which it is concluded that the problems with unidentified flying objects appear to have implications for psychological warfare as well as for intelligence and operations. The background for this view is presented in some detail. I suggest that we discuss at an early board meeting the possible offensive or defensive utilization of these phenomena for psychological warfare operations. CIA Director Walter B. Smith, Memo to CIA Psychological Strategy Board, 1952. Of course we could go on speculating endlessly about who the men in black really are, what they are up to, where they come from, how they fit into the UFO mystery, and so on. I certainly don't claim to know all the answers, and I don't think anybody else does. I'd like to qualify my ideas about government intelligence operations and how these could be responsible for some of the cases. I'm not saying that the CIA, Air Force, NASA, FBI, or NSA are behind all of the Men in Black stories. The MIB tradition involves a vast, complex bundle of circumstances and phenomena that defy one simple explanation. Come to think of it, it is the same way with UFOs themselves, with which the notorious three seem to be connected. Pour yourself a cup of coffee, a real strong one, while I tell just one more CIA-type tale. It involves Jennings H. Frederick, a young Air Force veteran who lives about 30 miles from me. I may be leaving out the best story, how previous to his entering service he encountered a weird UFO-related creature that I call the Vegetable Man, because of its green, stalk-like appearance. This thing grabbed him and induced a state of paralysis while it drew a blood sample from his arm. At another time, his mother was terrified by a devil-like creature that emerged from a UFO parked in a pasture field above her home. When I interviewed him, I found him to be a husky man in his early thirties. His precise and clear language, like the letters he had sent me, hardly gave hint of his rural upbringing. He never employed the localisms and brogue that often crept into my own speech. He was a coal miner and an amateur rocket expert. Frankly, he impressed me. I knew he wasn't a kook or a candidate for the nuthouse, although Deep beneath the surface of his calm demeanor, I could sense something else, a note of controlled urgency, or maybe pangs of suppressed terror. I also sensed this wasn't due to the frightening creature encounter, but to something else, something that had happened more recently after his honorable discharge from the Air Force. I listened raptly as he reluctantly related the incident. Near the end of his enlistment, Frederick was assigned to temporary duty with NASA and given a security clearance. It is interesting to note, in connection with the MIB account below, that while working for NASA, he had obviously encountered evidence of some secret project dealing with UFOs. Although I did not press for information about this, he hinted that there had been a lapse of security at NASA and that several people were sacked as a result. I got the impression that he had seen plans or models of some secret aircraft because he questioned me at length about what I knew of the history of the Avro Saucer, an early jet-powered airfoil taken over from the Canadian government by the U.S. It had been highly touted in publicity releases by the Air Force. It seemed obvious that the Air Force was aiming at the publicity of those who believed UFOs were of interplanetary origin in order to subtly persuade them that UFOs had an earthly and military origin. The Avro Saucer supposedly never flew successfully and is now on display at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. About four months after his discharge, Frederick had the run-in 
with the MIB. Quoting Frederick, I was living with my parents and slept on a cot near a window. One night sometime between 1 and 4 a.m., I was awakened by a red flash. I thought the gas furnace had caught fire, so I rose up in bed and looked into the living room where my younger brother Bill was sleeping. I saw a small canister about the size of an apple come bouncing across the living room floor. It was giving off a red-colored vapor. I instinctively reached for my thirty-eight, which I always kept loaded under my pillow when living in the country, but a hand stopped me. I felt the prick of a needle in my left arm. I saw three men dressed in black turtleneck sweaters, slacks, and ski masks entering the room through the window. I assumed there was a fourth one that gave me the needle. One of them said, the dogs have been darted and everybody gassed. Another asked, what about this one, will he remember? The other replied, he's going out soon, he's half asleep already, don't worry about the needle, it will make his arm sore for a day or two, that's all. Just as the red gas from the canister was beginning to reach me, the men put on gas masks over their ski masks that they had on. The last thing I remember seeing was one man opening a suitcase with a tape recorder in it and another grabbing the canister and stuffing it into his jacket pocket. Then they stuck something over my face and began to ask me questions, mainly about my UFO sightings and what I thought the UFOs actually were. I'm sure I was losing consciousness for their other questions sounded very stupid such as what did I know about time and questions about the future." End quote. The next morning, nobody else in the household reported anything strange about the previous night. Frederick assumed the red vapor from the canister had knocked them out. When we analyze Frederick's account, we are struck immediately by the idea that his MIB acted and sounded very much like terrestrial visitors with their talk of gassing and darting the dogs and it does not require an immense stretch of the imagination to connect the visit with his inadvertent contact with classified information while with NASA. The injection suggests some form of narco-hypnotic drug or truth serum. Whoever the visitors were, they didn't seem to be indoctrinating him with ideas, and unlike other MIB, they didn't threaten him or warn him to stop talking about his experiences. From what he could remember of their questions before he lost consciousness, his testimony suggests the men were merely trying to find out what he knew, possibly how much classified information he had retained from the NASA incident. Of course, I probably couldn't convince UFO expert John Keel that these were human intelligence operatives. If you've read his books, you'll remember his many references to UFO occupants who, in their contacts with Earth residents, often seem to be confused about time. And remember, Frederick's visitors asked him questions about time and the future. Of course, we could write this off as faulty memory while Frederick was going under, or the MIB checking his depth of trance, but there are always these little doubts that creep into MIB cases which leave us without decent ironclad explanations. Maybe these misgivings are what make the MIB so fascinating. Any writer expressing pat explanations has just never studied a cult tradition in which the MIB are firmly established. As military secret weapon theories can never explain UFOs which have been seen from the dawn of recorded history, the CIA could not be responsible for all the MIB who have down through the centuries meddled into our affairs and, just as they do today, scare the living daylights out of us. Michael Talbot, writing in the New Atlantean Journal, provides us with illuminating insights into this idea. Quoting Talbot, In Eastern mysticism, there is an interesting analog for the MIB phenomena known as the Brothers of the Shadow. They are mentioned by Madame Blavatsky in many theosophical writings. The Brothers of the Shadow, according to Eastern adepts, are prominent actors. They are cunning and evil, intent upon keeping any student of the occult from finding out the proverbial answer. In mystical jargon, this answer is within the so-called Veil of Isis and is synonymous with the great secret of Maeterlinck. In occultism, as in the UFO problem, there is recorded a constant barrage of psychic hoaxes. The Brothers of the Shadow, like the MIB, are known for threatening students of the occult whenever they get too close to lifting the Veil of Isis. Madame Blavatsky refers to the Brothers of the Shadow as 
the leading stars on the great spiritual stage of materialization. End quote. The English novelist and member of the English Rosicrucian Society, Bulwer Lytton, was approaching the proverbial lifting of the veil in the last quarter of the 19th century. In September of 1875, Madame Blavatsky warned him that his dream of the hideous dweller of the threshold was only a warning. Make yourself ready, she wrote. In about 12 months, you will have to face and fight with them. According to a Lytton record in October of 1876, Madame Blavatsky's prediction of his confrontation with the Brothers of the Shadow came true. Lytton writes, quoting, I am fighting a hand-to-hand -hand battle with all of the torment, temptation, and foul suggestions. I can see them all around, glaring at me, gabbling, howling, grinning. Every form of filthy suggestion, of bewildering doubt, of mad and shuddering fear is upon me, but I have not wavered yet. Their temptations are fainter, the presence less near, the horror less. End quote. There are many strong parallels between the origins of theosophy and the UFO problem. As a young girl, Madame Blavatsky began having dreams in which mysterious spiritual teachers would instruct her in various doctrines. At one point in her life, she started receiving supposed astral visitations from two of these entities, the Mahatma Kuthumi Lai Singh, or Master K.H., and Maria, Master M. These Eastern teachers were said to belong to an occult brotherhood living in the trans-Himalayan vastness of Tibet. In 1880, one of Madame Blavatsky's disciples, the late S.P. Sinnott, then living in India, was enabled through the agency of Blavatsky to begin actual correspondence with the mysterious teachers themselves. In 1929, Sinet compiled a volume of his letters and the master's replies in a work entitled The Mahatma Letters. If one compares Madame Blavatsky and the Mahatma Letters with Morris K. Jessup and the Allende Letters, the association becomes striking. The masters, K.H. and M., divide the supernatural entities into two factions, the Ascended Masters, or spiritual guides, whose purpose is to aid humanity's spiritual evolution, and the Brothers of the Shadow, our so-called greatest, most cruel, and, why not confess, most powerful enemies. The enigmatic Carlos Allende, Mr. B, and Jemmy divide the UFO entities into two factions, the good L.M. men and the bad SM men, with whom the MIB perhaps belong. But the Ascended Masters, Brothers of the Shadow, LM men, and SM men, or MIB, were not necessarily involved in both deceptions. Both Madame Blavatsky and Morris K. Jessup were receiving their information from a third faction. It seems as if it were all part of the plot. There are strange giveaways that the psychons or channelers seem to delight in dropping for instance they apparently enjoy making distinctions among the authors of such communications by using separate colors for pencil or ink in several examples of messages supposedly dropped from the airships in the 1897 flap the written letters would be in either red or blue pencil similarly the authors of the Allende letters each used a different color ink, just as Master K.H. always wrote in blue pencil or ink, and the Master M. always wrote in red pencil or ink. More important, though, is the explanation given by both Carlos Allende and the Mahatmas for their thorough knowledge of the affairs and past history of humanity. The Mahatmas belong to a secluded occult brotherhood. According to them, they are one of three occult brotherhoods that exist on Earth. These have existed for virtually centuries, preserving the sacred tradition of esoteric knowledge and offering clues about the great secret to worthy initiates. Like the Allende letters, they warn the seeker on the path that he is in great danger when he begins to approach the answer and must be exceedingly careful. The Mahatmas claim that they have kept their vast store of knowledge secret because humankind is not yet ready for it. 
Their introduction of Eastern mysticism via Madame Blavatsky is only a test to see how Western civilization reacts to the wisdom of the ages. Similarly, Mr. A and Mr. B and Jemmy blatantly hint that they are part of an ancient race, gypsies instead of Tibetans, who have a complete knowledge of the UFO phenomena because they have been studying it for, for ages. Mr. B states cryptically, only a gypsy will tell another of that catastrophe, and we are a discredited people ages ago. After Bulwer Lytton withstood the attacks of the Brothers of the Shadow, he compiled a great deal of his occult beliefs in a novel known as Vril, The Power of the Coming Race. In it, his protagonist stumbles upon an underground civilization that is in possession of the secret of the universe, the power of Vril. He slowly realizes that they are very much the superior race, and ultimately, he has to flee the subterranean race to escape death. At the end of the novel, he makes one last ominous, intriguing remark. Quoting, The more I think of a people developing in regions excluded from our sight and deemed uninhabitable by our sages, powers surpassing our most disciplined modes of force and virtues towards which our advancing civilization is antagonistic, the more devoutly I pray that ages may yet elapse before there emerges into sunlight our inevitable destroyer. Being, however, frankly told by my physician that I am afflicted by a complaint which may at any time be fatal, I thought it my duty to place on record these four warnings of the coming race. End quote. Like Bulwer Lytton, Albert K. Bender was also approaching a threshold. He thought he had figured out the secret of the UFO, but the MIB silenced him, much like they tried to silence Lytton. In 1962, however, Bender broke his silence with his well-known book Flying Saucers and the Three Men. In it, he presents an interesting parallel to Lytton's Vril Society with an account of his astral projection to a secret underground saucer base in Antarctica, which was manned by male, female, and androgynous creatures. The point is that the channeler wants to convey a body of archetypal traditions to humanity, some will contrive any deception to achieve this, and in ancient times humankind would readily accept a body of archetypal tradition from supposed manifestations of the gods. But as the zeitgeist became more skeptical, the psychons had to change their methods. Actual written communications appeared mysteriously from the master K.H. and M., but in the 20th century the information is conveyed through the most believable medium modern man can possess, the U.S. mail, not the mouth of God. It is quite fitting that the brothers of the shadow of the East retain their Eastern features as we moved out of the 19th century mysticism and into the 20th century technology and the UFO problem. That was chapter 13 from Men in Black, The Secret Terror by Gray Barker.